On Sunday, April 6, 1941, Germany launched a whirlwind attack on the Balkan Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The country put up little resistance. German losses were slight, but the punishment they inflicted was frightful. In Belgrade, the capital, which Hitler ordered to be taught a lesson, 10,000 people were killed by bombs. After nine days, Yugoslavia surrendered. That seemed to be the end of it. Instead, it turned out to be the beginning of a partisan uprising, led by a man who had spent his life as a communist revolutionary, disguised beneath a number of aliases. Josip Broz, or as the world came to know him, Tito. After the war, Tito ruled Yugoslavia as an uncrowned king. In uniforms of his own design and superbly tailored suits, he dressed a role that impressed his visitors and attracted his fellow countrymen. For a man of peasant origin, his tastes were expensive and his hospitality lavish. He believed it suited the temperament of his people to display finery, although it hardly fitted orthodox communist dogma. Despite or because of morning whiskey and cigars, Tito remained active until well into his 80s. The most impressive quality of Josef Broz Tito to me was always his commanding presence, the presence of a man of almost regal bearing, a quality of leadership that he must have taught himself many years ago he filled a room. Uh, he dominated everyone else around him, uh, whether in a foreign setting or at home. And you had the feeling of this presence always, even when he was clowning, he had a dignified bearing. And of course, uh, he was the former drill sergeant who had learned how to make people obey him in the Austro-Hungarian army in World War I. And he carried this same quality of leadership into the Communist Party and into the partisan war where he was the commander-in-chief. When the war began, Tito was in Moscow. Because of Stalin's pact with Hitler, communists had to lie low as the Nazis quickly overran Poland and turned against France and Britain. Released at last by Stalin, Tito took three months to make his way back to Yugoslavia. Hitler expected Yugoslavia to collaborate with Germany, but popular demonstrations forced the royalist government to resist. After Yugoslavia's collapse, the leader of the royalists became Colonel Draja Mihailovic. Tito and the communists demonstrated solidarity with Stalin. Despite police harassment, they too prepared to resist. Very early on, Tito, as a communist, said, first of all, we will be a Yugoslav Communist Party, and we will have cells, units, and representation in every corner of the country. Tito brought all this together with all these ancient rivals. So his was the only group that had this vision of a federated socialist state and he carried this message among the downtrodden peasants 
and uh, among university intellectuals. It was a very appealing vision. Tito was unknown outside Communist Party circles. His call for an all-out popular uprising came only when Germany invaded Russia in June 1941. From the outset, his partisans were involved in a savage internal struggle against other Yugoslav movements. They were fighting Chetniks over the next mountain, uh, Serbian nationalists and royalists, the Ustasha, the fascist puppets of Hitler. Bulgar troops came crashing in, uh, of course, the regular German army and the Italian army. Uh, so they were surrounded, of course, that is what partisan warfare is. Tito proved he was a gifted leader of men. Although seldom out of danger himself, he maintained strict control over his scattered units of partisans. The Germans put a price on his head. More than once, a surprise attack forced Tito into moving his headquarters across rugged terrain. The toll of the war was incredible. The Yugoslavs lost 1,700,000 citizens, and the country was devastated uh, by bombs, uh, partisan campaigns, uh, reprisals, uh, burning of whole villages. Uh, it was a, a real bloodbath. And, uh, of course, Tito was a cause of some of that bloodshed, too. Uh, he was not merciful to his enemies. Throughout the war, Tito maintained radio contact with Moscow, but it was the British who first gave him practical aid. At the same time, the British were supporting Tito's royalist opponents, who represented the government in exile. It was clear that by early 1943 that he had a very sizable force uh, and was uh, tying up maybe 20 divisions uh, of Germans, and this was very, very valuable to the Western Allies, and they felt compelled to establish liaison with him. The British, and later the Americans, wanted actually to have liaison with, with the forces that uh, were contending to dominate uh, post-war Yugoslavia. To the Soviets, Tito was still known as Walter, his Moscow code name. In his dealings with Churchill and Roosevelt, Stalin did not want any communist success in Yugoslavia to spoil his larger plans. In the last year of the war, the Soviets began to provide some help to Tito. One by one, the capitals of Eastern Europe fell to the advancing Red Army, which led the Nazi leader Goebbels to write, as soon as the Soviets have occupied a country, they let fall an iron curtain so that they can carry on their fearful, bloody work behind it. Stalin had agreed with Churchill to a 50-50 share of interest in Yugoslavia. With the fall of Bucharest, capital of Romania, the Red Army was at the frontiers of Yugoslavia. At the end of October 1944, Tito entered Belgrade in triumph. I think it's fair to say of Tito and the Yugoslavs that they liberated themselves, that there has been a repeated Soviet historical line from the outset that the Red Army played the principal role in liberating Yugoslavia. But there's no question that the bulk of the fighting and the bulk of the liberating actions were done by the partisans. Tito's partisans had grown into an army of 300,000 soldiers. With this force, he had the power to ensure his political victory as well. Opponents were rounded up and most of them liquidated. Tito's domestic enemy, number one, Draja Mihailovic, claimed to be fighting for the king. He was put on what was really a show trial, Stalin style, and made a very strong defense of the restoration of the royal kingdom of Yugoslavia. Mihailovic was duly executed, a victim, he said, of the gale of the world. Another victim was Poland, where the war had begun. Bogus elections supervised by Stalin's commissars 
reduced the country to a Soviet satellite. Meanwhile, Tito made a bid for the Italian port of Trieste, which caused Churchill to speak of an iron curtain stretching from the Baltic to the Adriatic. The British forced Tito back. The end of the war against Germany meant an immediate beginning to the Cold War. Yugoslavia now appeared as the champion of communist aggression in Central Europe. This was not at all to the liking of Stalin, however, who boasted that he had only to shake his finger and there would be no more Tito. Stalin and his cronies still spoke of Tito as a Balkan peasant. There was an extraordinary sequence right after the end of the war when Tito was hailed in Warsaw, Prague, and in Bucharest as a war hero, this made him something of a rival uh, of Stalin. Stalin said once, uh, uh, what is Tito trying to be, the, the Stalin of the Balkans? And the Russians traditionally distinguish only between vassals and enemies, and since Tito wasn't a vassal, he became an enemy. And Stalin saw his power being threatened by this upstart. For a time, Stalin hid his displeasure while he consolidated his hold on other satellite states. In Czechoslovakia, the much-respected Benish had returned from exile to preside over an uneasy balance between Democrats and Stalinists. Early in 48, to forestall elections, the Stalinists took over. The popular Jan Masaryk was found dead, possibly murdered and soon after Benish himself died a broken man. Czechoslovakia had fallen under the Soviet jackboot. All his life, Tito had been a dedicated communist. On his several visits to Moscow, he acknowledged the leading role of the Soviet Union in the worldwide revolutionary movement. He had also gained first-hand experience of Stalin's purges. Indeed, it was thanks to them that he had become Yugoslavia's party boss. At first, open defiance of Stalin was unthinkable. But as Stalin's insults grew more threatening, Tito found himself driven to resist. Suddenly, the oaths and allegiances of three decades were going up in smoke. The final break came in June 48. For Tito, it was a crisis equal to his most dangerous moments of World War II. Just as in 41 and 42, when Tito's partisans fought without a shred of outside support, Yugoslavia now stood utterly alone. When the break came, to the great surprise of, I think, a lot of Yugoslavs, and certainly the Russians, there were hardly any defections. There was no movement uh, to overthrow Tito. There were... Um, Stalin sympathizers here and there, one or two in high places, but there was no movement to overthrow Tito. In this great test, love of country proved stronger than loyalty to the Soviet Union. Tito had staked out Yugoslavia's right to take her own path to socialism. To save Yugoslavia from starving, Tito turned to the West for aid, and the West obliged in order to contain Soviet influence in Europe. The Soviets stepped up their propaganda against Tito, accusing him of being a capitalist lackey. Yugoslavia, 39. The chair therefore declares Yugoslavia elected the third Non At the United Nations, Vyshinsky launched into a violent tirade on Stalin's behalf. I wish to call uh, the delegate of the yes, Soviet Union. Yes, just can try. 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 The remarks just heard entirely out of order. Slowly, Tito won acceptance again in the West. In 1953, he went to London. We arrived in the land of the great British people, followed with the sincere sympathies of the people of my country. <laughs> 
it was the brave people of Great Britain. Although my visit, which comes as a result, result of the invitation in extended to me by the British government and by Mr. Chir Winston Churchill personally, has not formally the character of an official visit. I am nevertheless profoundly convinced that it will be greatly contribute that it will greatly contribute to the further strengthening of the friendship, mutual understanding and collaboration between our two nations. Churchill certainly didn't love Tito's politics. Uh, Churchill was one of the great anti-communists of, of the century, but uh, he saw in Tito a, a great fighter and a great leader. John Foster Dulles was no admirer of Tito's politics either, but America and Yugoslavia shared an interest in keeping the Soviet Union away from the Mediterranean. Power legitimizes these twists of policy. We are dialecticians, Tito once said, and we know that what is good today or necessary today becomes neither good nor as necessary tomorrow. Marshal Tito, would you like to take this opportunity when you are appearing before the people of America to give them any special message? Yes, yes. yes I will take this opportunity to send my greetings to America's people, to all them in America who understand our difficulties, who have sympathy for a for, uh, free and independent Yugoslavia. Tito's greatest triumph came when the key to Khrushchev arrived in Belgrade to offer an abject apology seven years after the break with Stalin. Tito gave the Russians a chilly reception and waited to see what they had to offer. The Soviets needed reconciliation with Yugoslavia to strengthen their position in the communist world. Tito insisted on Yugoslavia's socialist independence. For a short while, Tito appeared to have gained a special influence over Soviet policies. Khrushchev gave him a splendid reception when Tito visited Russia in 1956, his first visit in 10 years, but the sequel was shattering. First, Poland took advantage of the idea of independent communist development, although a series of show trials checked open rebellion. Then things rapidly got out of hand in Hungary. As an independent himself, Tito sympathized with the aspirations of the Hungarians and Poles in 1956 to achieve a measure of independence from the Soviet Union. And Tito gave sanctuary to uh, Hungarian freedom fighters, leaders in the Yugoslav embassy in Budapest and was crushed to see the Soviet troops invade uh, Hungary to topple the more or less independent government that had been set up in Budapest. The brutality of Soviet intervention in Hungary made Tito aware once again that only Yugoslavia's known power of resistance could save her from a similar fate. He once said, Yugoslavia will never be conquered except over the dead bodies of its people. Maintaining the constant strength of his forces was a matter of top priority. At the same time, Tito went on tinkering with Yugoslavia's constitution to give the country greater functional unity. His personality dominated others and there was no direct challenge to his power. Tito enjoyed considerable influence among the leaders of the Third World, but his friendships gave him prestige rather than power. Meetings between heads of state brought Yugoslavia no military security against a Soviet invasion of the kind experienced by Czechoslovakia. Tito supported Alexander Dubček in Prague in 1968, visited Prague at the very last minute to demonstrate solidarity with the Czechoslovak communist reformers uh, and was dismayed uh, and even frightened by the Soviet invasion 
television had exposed the nakedness of power, however much the Soviets might try and dress it up after the event. Equally, Tito realized that Yugoslavia could not survive in permanent hostility to a superpower on its very frontiers. Aging rulers are as promiscuous with their medals as power herself is with her lovers. When they met in Moscow, neither Tito nor Brezhnev could be sure how things might change once they were gone. Tito had a dream. He got the idea, apparently, sometime in the 1920s, of a free, strong and independent Yugoslavia and a socialist Yugoslavia. He began to realize this dream in the Communist Party and then in the great partisan uprising and war against the German and Italian and Bulgarian invaders. He succeeded and the state that he created, the new Yugoslavia, he then had to defend against very powerful enemies, the Russians, and he succeeded not only in defending against any encroachments, but winning eventual acceptance from these enemies, not only from the Russians, but ultimately from the Chinese who had denounced him as a revisionist and a capitalist lackey for 30 years. At the end of his life, he was welcomed in Peking uh, as a conquering hero.